Hey everyone, welcome back for another video. I am super excited to have Dr. Taylor, Taylor Burroughs on with me today. She is an absolutely amazing relationship expert. Um, you were also a therapist, right? Yes, I had a license in marriage and family therapy and a license in mental health counseling, but I retired them in 2019. Okay, got it. Well, I have been totally binging your Instagram account, your YouTube videos. I, yeah, I've been going way back <laughs> and I just really love your perspective. I love the way you present yourself. And um, yeah, you just strike me as someone who has a very mature mindset on love and relationships, very realistic and grounded mindset. And so I thought that you would be the perfect person to talk about what love is supposed to feel like today. So thanks so much for taking the time. Oh, thank you for, for having me. And I think this is an awesome topic. <laughs> um, love has been such a, a focal point of my work and not just professionally, but I think personally, um, we can kind of get into the, some of the esoteric woo-woo stuff, but <laughs> I've always felt very connected to the goddesses of love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I did a little pilgrimage, I think it was 2017. Uh, I went to Egypt, Greece and Rome, and I specifically was on a mission to connect with the goddesses of love of each country. <laughs> and oh, wow. uh, I, I uh, connected mostly with Aphrodite. <laughs> and uh, my my pilgrimage to the to the to Venus in uh, Rome was a crazy whirlwind 24 hours but interestingly we couldn't find her like the temple of venus was didn't exist and so wow. it's an interesting journey and and after that i really shifted a bit because i needed to heal and i need to needed to really get aligned with how i viewed love and mm -hmm. my role in that mm -hmm. and so a lot of what you're seeing now are on my youtube channel is more the later stages of the last five years versus previous to that. Like everybody else, you know, I did my own journey and searching and tried to make sense of it and who's right and who's wrong. And even my professional expertise, you know, like marriage and family therapy, you're supposed to know how, what works and what doesn't, but that wasn't the answer for me either. So it wasn't mm -hmm. until like, I kind of, I call it my sweet spot. I kind mm -hmm. of, started on one end and then did my journey, ended up the other, and then found my sweet spot. That's so interesting. That That's so interesting that you couldn't find the Temple of Venus. That like, I feel like that's such a poetic, like almost metaphorical thing. Like love is this like elusive thing. Yeah, I <laughs> that know. That people have a hard time finding. <laughs> that's why I said, I hope you don't mind if I get a little woo woo because it was like this funny experience, but you know, it kind of doesn't make that much sense when you try to explain it. <laughs> it's just one of those things. I ended up in an Airbnb with this awesome girl and she was like oh my god I love this mission I'm dropping my plans and I'm coming with you so we went on this mission and it was just the most mysterious thing we were asking like Roman like the, the Italian people in Rome the people at like tourist places and like police officers and they kept pointing us this way and we're looking at the map and it was like this black hole and it, you could not you could not locate the actual temple. It didn't exist. And it was this very fake facade kind of feeling. Mm. And I felt connected to Aphrodite. I found her intuitively. Like I just got in the car and drove on the road by myself on, in Milos, Greece, not knowing where I was going. And I ended up at the ruins and where she was last seen or something. I don't know. And it just felt like a really strong connection. But supposedly that's what happened. Italy borrowed... Aphrodite as an archetype and created this sort of, um, you know, the goddess of, of Venus. But I think the origin is really Aphrodite. So that's my Very theory. interesting. I am like all about the woo-woo stuff. So <laughs> definitely no hesitation going into any of that stuff there. So very interesting. Sounds like an amazing adventure. And yeah, <laughs> would you say, so, so, at this point in your life, going through everything you've been through, what would you say love is supposed to feel like now for you? Like, do you think it should feel like anything? Because I know that a lot of people say that love is not really a feeling. It's more of an action and that you're, um, it's more of like a, a decision you make to commit to someone every day. But, you know, 
you see a lot of marriages ending in divorces, divorce these days. And sometimes I think it's because people focus more so on the feeling than on the commitment, but it's hard to stay in a commitment when you don't feel the feeling. So what's love supposed to feel like? Yeah, I think this is the shift that your evolution, your development uh, really takes you through is seeing love as infatuation and lust, really, mm -hmm. the lens that it's more like a lustful feeling mm -hmm. and recognizing that, you know, that may be the honeymoon stage in the beginning where all of your um, neurotransmitters and hormones are going crazy and you you start to have that, um, the attachment process that will eventually fade a little bit like those uh, reactions will dissipate somewhat so that part is the lustful part in the infatuation is is a part of love mm -hmm. but love is more than a feeling absolutely so um what as you mature and hopefully not everybody does so it's yeah. not like a given that you will mature to this understanding but recognizing that healthy love is a secure love and it is a choice it's how you serve the people that matter to you and mm -hmm. it's the, the the responsibility the investment that you commit to over time mm -hmm. uh, but we can take our time and walk through that I don't want to well, yeah I think I, so yeah so the whole infatuation thing a lot of people confuse that for love and that when that feeling goes away, they tend to break up. I'm sure you're, I'm sure with all the people you've coached by now, you, like you've seen that three month pattern that happens where people start dating and then after three months, it everything just falls apart because in, the infatuation kind of dies off. And at that point, people think that they're not in love anymore or they've fallen out of love. Um, what would you say to these people, like in relationships like that, what would you say are the things that they should be focused on at that three month mark when that infatuation starts to die off? Well, I think it's kind of exciting, you know, when you do, and some people choose to have sex and some people choose not to, right? Like some people are waiting until marriage, mm -hmm. um, and that can play a part in it as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we want to necessarily go there, but we can, um, but, but when you are <laughs> going through that honeymoon phase and after a couple of months sort of facing the reality of who the person is and not your projection of who you imagine them to be or what your hormones were kind of <laughs> telling you they represented for you and maybe the rose-colored glasses come off, it's a true test of compatibility. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, a relationship starts to develop roots is when you recognize how compatible you are as a team and projecting towards the future, mm -hmm. you're building towards something similar, like if your paths merge. Mm -hmm. So if you don't think through all of these values and standards and, and you know, lifestyle factors beforehand, then you can kind of be shocked when all of those, uh, all that infatuation wears off and you're left kind of, with this awkwardness and yeah. not feeling a spark if there's no compatibility or no conscious vetting, which is the mm -hmm. term that I use, right? If you haven't been vetting them actively, then, you know, you're kind of starting from scratch with the person that feels unreal to you, like almost like, you know, where did the person go that I was addicted to all this yeah. time? Yeah, addiction, exactly. I feel like so many people confuse love for this almost emotional addiction when I don't know I mean do you think have you ever um have you ever like noticed how some people for some people when they're actually in secure relationships they find themselves very bored and it's almost like they 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 need some kind of emotional roller coaster to to convince themselves that it's love <laughs> Yes, this happens a lot, um, just in general, too, not even about love and relationships, but about life. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who have come from dysfunctional backgrounds and hardship, trauma, you know, maybe they're not mentally ill or pathological, but they've just, they've, the familiar is the negative stuff. You know, like when things are, are not going well, when things are unhealthy, they feel at home. 
Mm. And so when something is actually healthy and good, because healthy doesn't mean easy, right? Like it's not right. easy to be healthy. You have to work hard for it, mm -hmm. but it feels good. You know, mm -hmm. if, if that's, if you know what you're going for and you, you get used to it, um, the consistency element of health, whether it's in a relationship or in your life choices generally, uh, it can be boring to people who have that compulsive itch and mm -hmm. addiction to dysfunction, mm -hmm. and have that compulsive element to their personality or relationship dynamics. So without all of those ups and downs in a relationship that keep you addicted, it really does create this opportunity to confront yourself mm -hmm. in a really uncomfortable, scary kind of way. Um, if you haven't dealt with, you know, your own self-awareness and self-growth, if you haven't done the work, yeah. <laughs> then yeah, relationships are going to be a, a big catalyst for that. You definitely. So what would you say is the different? Cause you know, I've seen you make posts. Um, I think it was a post that you made where you were talking about the difference between a good relationship versus a great one, like one that um, kind of maybe has that spark versus one that doesn't. How can someone really tell the difference between whether they're in a good relationship, but they're just feeling bored because of something that's within them versus a bored feeling because there really is just no spark? Okay, let me think about what's the best way to describe that or a good example for us mm -hmm. to talk about. I think, well, in my ideal relationship system, my vetting system, I talk about logic plus desire plus love mm -hmm. equals that ideal relationship. And obviously this is an oversimplistic way of looking at it, but just to be uh, for conversation and to, to think about something that's easily accessible in our minds. Mm -hmm. The logic is usually the one that is ignored the most people following like their feelings and yeah. negating like, okay, we're, we're not compatible, but I really like them and I'm <laughs> so attracted to them. So I'm just going to go for it. Right. So if you have, I say, I use the measure of like, let's say eight out of 10 is mm -hmm. the standard to shoot for, but it's really hard to quantify these types of elements in relationships, but mm -hmm. Do need to have sexual desire. You need to have that genuine physical connection and chemistry, mm -hmm. right? So if you have maybe, I don't know, let's say you have a five or lower in the desire element, then that's not going to work. Even if you have high compatibility in the logic component and high love and affection and in, in their in your companionship with them, your attachment to them is strong. It still won't stand the test of time. It might last for a little bit, but it's going to be a complacent type of relationship where you're going to end up like roommates, right? Mm -hmm. But if you are missing the other ones, like you can't compensate you know, a 10 out of 10 in the desire component and a, you know, let's say an eight out of 10 in love with this uh, incompatibility of like a four out of, out of 10 in logic. It just, it's, it'll burn really mm -hmm. hot for a short time and then it will fizzle out, maybe crash yeah. really badly. Um, so I see that happen a lot. So you don't want to be stuck in either of those extremes, right? You don't want to get mm -hmm. into the complacent roommate relationship you don't want to be, well, I mean, if you are consciously choosing a short-term relationship and both people are okay with it ending, mm -hmm. that's fine. But if you're trying to be in a long-term relationship slash marriage and you put all your, your hope in a, like a hot burning romance that really is based on a rocky foundation of a lack of compatibility, then you're going to be unpleasantly surprised, right? Mm -hmm. When it all falls apart. But- I don't know if that answers part of your question. I think there's more. It does. It does. I mean, so that that's something that I've noticed in a lot of um, relationships I see around me is that people, it's like they get to this point in their lives where they think that they have to compromise their desire in order to just find something stable. It's like people, I feel like there's this um, disconnect sometimes where to be honest, I, I think I'm still working through this too, where I, there's like this belief that I have that a stable, healthy relationship means sacrificing 
that desire because there's like something in me, I think that just feels like a stable, healthy relationship means having to almost settle in a way, like settle for something that, you know, do you, do you kind of get where I'm coming from with that? I think so. I okay. think that's a normal yeah. assumption slash fear for a lot of people, mm-hmm. um, especially men, you know, I, I, their natural primal sexual instinct may be more towards variety. So mm-hmm. when you do uh, settle down and get married, you are saying, I'm committing to one person monogamously for the rest of my life, if that's what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And so they do have to give up that sexual gratification of, you know, having the option of novelty uh, Mm -hmm. in in their partners. Women, you know, I know this is a, 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 what do you call it? Like a slippery slope conversation, depending on what your sexual orientation is and what type of relationship structure you want. But I speak from heterosexual monogamous perspective. So Mm -hmm. if it's an alternative one, then that's totally fine. But in regards to, I guess, like there's a difference between settling down Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. settling for less, which Mm -hmm. is the distinction I use with the clients that I work with. So settling for less is um, like kind of what I was saying. It's uh, finding something that you like about a person but it's not the whole picture. So Mm -hmm. you don't have to have a hundred percent of everything. You don't have to have amazing, passionate, mind blowing sex with someone in order to genuinely desire them. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that is what most people do. They err on assuming it's either all or nothing. Yeah, definitely. Right. And so really to me, the measure, and, and this might sound really practical, but I think it's a good reframe for women, especially Someone who you can always have sex with willingly and happily whenever it's like approached or, you know what I mean? Like for the most part, obviously we're going to have our days when we're really not feeling well or something's going on with our bodies and we're Mm -hmm. just like, "Eh, maybe now's not a great time, (laughs) you know, um, as long as your willingness, like your openness and receptivity is there with someone, then you genuinely desire them. And, and, you know, that's there's no, so like, good. That's that so good. Sense? That is so clear. And like, yes, absolutely. That makes perfect sense. You know, you had made a post about how um, a lot of uh, there's this common um, advice that gets thrown around that a lasting relationship is one where the man loves the woman more. And you had made a post about how that's actually wrong. Um, could you get into that a little bit oh, and talk yeah. about that? Because I think I think that's kind of what this is getting at. I love that that idea. I mean, it's a personal one for me, right? So my not to call out my mom, sorry, <laughs> but my mother always ingrained in my head that marry a man that loves you more, mm-hmm. um, and it was you know something that was echoed a lot in, in my generation at least, and I think a lot of women commented on that post saying, Oh yeah, I've heard that too. I, I totally believed it was true. I've heard that so much. You did. Okay. So it wasn't just where I was and, and when I was coming up, but basically Our mothers might be the same. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I think the idea of that is about protecting yourself, right? Like you want to make sure the man is going to be loyal to you, right? They're not going to betray you and that they're going to, Ultimately, it's pedestalizing you is the problem. So if they adore you in that sense, um, obviously, they're not respecting themselves as much as they should be. They're putting you on the pedestal and kind of worshiping you because they're head over heels infatuated with you. And that might make you feel safe, like, okay, you know, I don't have to worry about them wanting another woman. But it creates a whole lot of other problems with polarity and you're settling for them basically uh, based on a fear scarcity (laughs) mindset and not because you genuinely are choosing them. And 
pe people often misunderstand me when I say that, saying that men shouldn't be like romantic with the woman or they shouldn't demonstrate love to the woman. But that's not what I'm trying to say in that post. Mm -hmm. No, I, I completely agree with you. I think relationships like that, where the woman ends up with a man who desires her more, it tends to end up in that kind of classic, like, I hate to use these terms, but like beta male with a woman who's very masculine and they kind of have this dynamic that can sometimes turn into like a mother son dynamic or like some kind of weird, like, yeah, like there's no real desire on the woman's part for the man sexually. It may start off okay. Because mm -hmm. um, sometimes this is actually attractive men, like mm -hmm. classically attractive men that have been feminized a little bit in their, mm -hmm. you know, child rearing, their family upbringing or whatever, society. And so the woman connects and is attracted to him on a superficial level, mm -hmm. but she doesn't really respect him on a deep level. She appreciates what he does for her, but it's based on in like an entitlement princess complex, right? Like it's that ego mm -hmm. um, satisfaction, but it doesn't last that it will bring out the worst in the people over time, right? The mm -hmm. woman will end up hypergamous and looking for someone better. Mm -hmm. And the man will start to really like break down, like his masculinity is, is going to erode and it's going to bring on a lot of, a lot of other problems for him psychologically. Mm hmm. So would you say that it would be better for the woman to want the man more than he wants her? Or is there any way for it to be equal, like they have an equal level of desire for each other? Or is that just like impossible? <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's not meant to be literal, like the woman has to love yeah. the man more if because it depends on what we're using as like the definition of love. Mm -hmm. If you're using the flowery feminine idea of love, which is what people are normally referencing when they talk about love, mm -hmm. it's it's kind of like this default, I don't know, like a representation of love that people have. Mm -hmm. And a woman should be the one who does that more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Interesting. So she, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and even like service, um, it doesn't mean that men don't, they are not of service to a woman. Of course, the man is going to be of service to his wife in many ways, but it doesn't have to look the same. Mm -hmm. And I, I made this comment on a TikTok and that's, I've only just started TikTok and this was one that is like over 20,000 now views or whatever. And a lot of people are, are criticizing me for criticizing somebody else saying that um their the love she was talking about her love language or, or, or her husband's love languages how mm -hmm. he satisfies her love languages and mm -hmm. she just shows all of these over the top really feminine things that he's doing for her like he put rose petals on the floor shapes like spelling out love he sends her all these lovey-dovey messages about oh my god how much i love you like the, the mm -hmm. engagement ring is like a huge diamond mm -hmm. and he's serving her breakfast like over and over and over and over again. And so I was commenting how this is a problem. Like it's mm -hmm. great, it's cute that he loves her and he's demonstrating his love in all these ways, but she, it looks like she only appreciates the feminine demonstrations of love from him. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's probably symbiotic, right? Like he doesn't know any better and she is just expecting to be pedestalized, but it's really important for us to see masculine demonstrations of love as equally valid. Very interesting. I, <laughs> the rose petal example, that's such an interesting one because whenever I've seen that, I have felt turned off and I can't understand why. It's like, Oh, this is a nice thing that he did, <laughs> but it's like, but there is something kind of feminine about it, like you're saying. So, what would you say are like, like what's the more masculine way of showing love? Well, I'm not a man, but if <laughs> I was, was to guess, like some of the things that they do, it's like more um, provision, service mm -hmm. in like what how they take care of things. They're worrying about safety. Mm -hmm. um, they take on a lot of stress and duty based on thinking about their role and, and making people proud and keeping people safe um, and active, you know, like the, the husband is usually 
the one who's doing the more like hands-on stuff. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not saying always, but yeah. stereotypically it, it might be the man who's the fun dad, you know, and doing all the activities with the kids, but the woman might be more of the caretaker role. And so I'm not saying it's just those things, but if you only see feminine demonstrations of love and don't see how men express their love in other ways, then you're missing part of the picture. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I think it's fine for men to express love in tender ways too, mm-hmm. but I, you know, and women may express love in more masculine ways as well, but you want to make sure that if you're in a, a, especially like heteronormative relationship or whatever, (laughs) like you want to be deferring or at least um, balancing Mm -hmm. correct energy so that you're not in this sort of skewed relationship lacking polarity. Right. Definitely. Definitely. That's so, that is so very interesting. So would you say like when a man is kind of displaying his love in very feminine ways to the woman, is that almost like a sign that he might be lacking purpose in his life and like ambition in his life? Cause I would imagine that a man with like purpose and ambition would probably not even have time to like be like focusing on all of these, like very, I don't know. I kind of see it almost as if like a, like a, a woman, like for a woman to be attracted for the long term, it's almost as if she needs to be the one who makes the relationship almost the center of her world, whereas the man has to make his purpose the center of his world and like um, have the relationship, of course, be also very important to him, but not like the the, the main focus. Would you say that that's true or would you say that that's maybe... A, a misrepresentation, what I'm saying. Neither. I think <laughs> that in the extreme stereotype, right? Like mm-hmm. uh, a man who is overly focused on the relationship, you're right. Like I think that obsessive mindset is a natural tendency for men to have. And mm-hmm. if you're channeling that towards the woman and making her happy mm-hmm. and just focusing on the relationship, he's going to be taking that energy from elsewhere, which might be his obsessive passion and purpose for himself. Mm -hmm. Right. And it doesn't mean you can't have, you know, two people with purpose, right? Like the woman can have a purpose as well, Mm -hmm. but if her purpose is divergent from his purpose, then their relationship is going to have a big splinter in Mm -hmm. it. And that's not going to work after a while. Um, So this is where people come up with like the power couple sort of archetype, right? Like you have to see the the power couple as complementary and not like, it's almost like parallel. They see two parallel alphas (laughs) (laughs) striving and obsessed about their passions, but you have to merge your purposes and they have to fit together and not compete for resources like time, attention, money, whatever, Mm -hmm. you have to work together. So if you don't create that um, plan, right? Like if you, if you're, you're sort of just passing ships in the night, I think that's what they say. Mm -hmm. Then uh, yeah, you become disconnected and detached with your, your partner, your spouse. So um for a man, you know, he can, the woman should be the most important woman in his life, mm-hmm. but she should not be more important than himself. Mm-hmm. And that's where I think people get the pedestalizing thing wrong. It's like, yeah, she's on a pedestal compared to all the other women in the world, but she's not on a pedestal where he's like on his knees mm-hmm. begging for her attention or right. approval. There's a big difference. Exactly. I mean, especially I would imagine that to be true, especially if if both people want to get married and have a family and everything. It's like if if the man is super hyper focused, I mean, if again, if I'm talking about a um, traditional style relationship between a man and a woman who want to be more in the traditional views of femininity and masculinity, like <laughs> I would imagine that if a man is kind of hyper-focused on the woman all the time, 
it would kind of maybe disable his ability to provide and keep the household going in a certain way. Like, I don't know. It's a, I think it's very important for the man to kind of like have his sense of purpose. But like you said, it's not something where the woman is just like falling by the wayside. Like she's still, like you said, it's, she's still on the pedestal of any other woman out there, but she's not like the, she's not above like his mission in life. Yeah. A lot of the men that I work with, mm -hmm. especially in the beginning, you know, they, they kind of evolve and, and that's the whole point is to, to shift and grow and become a, a, you know, better connected with their masculinity and just understanding healthy relationship dynamics. But a lot of men will feel selfish. Mm -hmm. like, like they were never given permission to put their needs first, mm. to think about their mission, their purpose, all of that sort of stuff over and above making other people happy because that's what society has done is they've overcorrected any wrongs that were done earlier on by some men who were in power and abused it mm -hmm. and have kind of brainwashed us to encourage men to put themselves aside and to do this. And mm -hmm. so un, like deprogramming us and recognizing that the healthy patriarch is the head of household. And mm -hmm. without that, the woman loses respect for him. Mm -hmm. And that's when the worst of our natures, going back to just our biology and, and you know, evolutionary primal natures, mm -hmm. the worst of us will come out when we mess with this stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that's like 90% of marriages out there these days is the one where like, it's almost like the man does lack purpose. And so the woman ends up feeling like she has to be in the driver's seat now because she can't rely on the man. Mm -hmm. And then that ends up creating this, like you said, this totally imbalanced energy where that kind of to totally kills the sexual attraction in the relationship. I actually want to address someone's comment right here. Sure. Um, Vaughn the Sun says, hearing Dr. Taylor talk is so cathartic. It makes me feel like I'm not a mean a-hole for feeling overwhelmed with how much attention and time my relationship takes up. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm glad yeah. that maybe this is like that seed that gets planted that you can start to prioritize your needs and not feel guilty, not be forced to feel guilty for... Mm -hmm you know, creating those boundaries. Do you think that a lot of this is the result of being raised by hypermasculine mothers and kind of the way that they almost train their sons to um, like people please for women? Do you think like that's something that creates that? Yeah. And, and speaking from just, you know, anecdotally and from my my own views. I don't know the research currently, but, you know, given like how the just marriages fell apart over, I don't know, however many decades, the divorce rate skyrocketing and single parent homes being so pervasive, you see how that has affected the later generations where the children were parentified and, you know, the sons became like pseudo husbands <laughs> to mothers and, then these dynamics got repeated in unhealthy relationships when those young women and like boys and girls grew up to develop their own dysfunctional attachments and relationship mm -hmm. structures in the home. And then we had the whole, you know, explosion of progressivism <laughs> and things just got, you know, even more confusing for everybody. So there's I so think many layers to this. <laughs> there, there really are. And the point is to get healthy as an individual first, right? Mm -hmm. Doing the work, looking at what did you experience? What was wrong? What was good? It's not about blaming your parents. Oftentimes they did the best that they could, mm -hmm. but we have to grow up. And if we want to break the cycle, we need to correct those distortions in our own personalities and our behaviors and take ourselves off the pedestal. Like a lot of people are just so egotistical and arrogant, mm -hmm. entitled and unwilling to do any of the work that they expect everybody else to cater to them. Mm -hmm. And that I think is the big problem. If we can humble ourselves, admit our flaws, correct them, improve our behaviors and our choices to be more responsible, then we're going to create better relationships overall. 
I, I think you're so right on about that. I think so. So your formula love equals, you said, um, or I'm sorry, a healthy relationship equals love plus desire plus logic. And would you say that, um, when you're making, when, when you're making that decision, like when you are in that vetting process and you're deciding if someone is gonna, um, be worth your time and everything, um, how much would you say like, cause okay. Like the whole, um, the whole attachment theory thing. I've, I've only recently started delving into that about, um, I know there's like a anxious attachment, avoidant attachment, then there's, um, anxious avoidant attachment also known as like, I think disorganized attachment. Um, when it comes to that, like sometimes I think in, relationships people almost might okay so i'm sorry i'm like getting all jumbled right now because i was thinking about one of the posts that you made about how you don't have to take on someone's trauma and that you shouldn't by um like making it seem okay kind of but i think when people are in relationships and they're vetting they kind of when when they desire someone so much they're more willing to kind of overlook those flaws that might be present in the beginning that might show that someone has that insecure attachment style. Mm -hmm. Like, would you say that it's not a good idea to try and like convert an insecure attachment style to a secure one through the relationship? Or is it better for someone to try to like be secure first and then start dating? Cause it seems like it's, it seems like the majority of people seem to be very insecure out here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This is a big question. I, I it's always going to be better if you were raised in a secure attachment with a healthy system, not perfect, right. But healthy. Mm -hmm. And if you're in that state, then it's going to make life so much easier. It's, you know, a luxury, a, a privilege, whatever you want to call it, but that's the way things should be. That mm -hmm. should be the goal, right? <laughs> is to, mm -hmm. to come from a healthy system and to create the next generation in a healthy system. But you don't have to be perfect to develop a healthy, ideal relationship. Mm -hmm. Vetting is an opportunity. And the way that I define vetting as opposed to dating mm -hmm is the process of getting to know someone, not jumping into dating. Because a lot of times people will just say, are you dating someone, you know, or whatever. Like the language refers to, do you go out on dates with people mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of dating apps, really? Like however many dates people have, you can't be dating a dozen people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's, that's it's irresponsible, but it's also misleading. If you're, if you're literally using a more conscious approach where you're getting to know someone as two single people, you can do that in a lot of different ways. I mean, obviously now we have like a global marketplace, a dating, you know, sort of population that we get to choose from because we have these online systems that we can connect with people. But if you have um, any kind of, you know, friends in, in, common or you see them in a natural setting, you can observe them. You can get to know people by lots of data sources. Um, you don't have to sit down over coffee or drink or dinner to get to know them. But what mm -hmm. a lot of people are doing is they're having zero contact with people and then just going out on a date and starting to get to know them. And then mm -hmm. they meet, they make the next date and they do nothing in the interim. And then they try to get to, but they're making these very fake uh, situations to try to get to know someone there, but they're performance driven. They're mm -hmm. like, news or they're, you know, you put on your nice dress and you go out for dinner and you do all your etiquette and it's going to be very ineffective to get to know someone that way. Whereas actually having conversations with someone experiencing more real life scenarios with people mm -hmm. rather than dinner, drinks, coffee, like even if you're going for a walk in the park, I love to suggest going to like a, a 
like a market, you know, a street market or a vendor market, some kind of weekly market where you can walk and talk and pick out things and mm -hmm. active, active things are great. Daytime activities, social activities, uh, like group activities. There's so many options, like be more creative, first of all. But if you're not experiencing real life things with people, you don't get to observe their reactions to stress, which is so important in the process of getting to know someone. So I would say dating someone is the, the time, like the shift when you decide, I'm gonna forego getting to know anybody else and start dating this person exclusively. I think you just like blew my mind. I hadn't, I've, I've been, this is something I've been thinking about because I see, I've seen you make posts too about how, yeah, you don't wanna be dating multiple people at the same time. And I, I don't think I really understood the difference between dating someone versus just casually getting to know someone. I kind of saw those things as like interchangeable or something. But so, but you're so right. Like dating almost involves, yeah, like putting on some kind of performance that's inevitably gonna fade away <laughs> when things get real. So, so, okay, I wanna talk about that a little bit more actually. So when you, when you kind of, talk about the difference between dating versus getting to know someone. Um, would you say that when you're in the process of getting to know someone, that it's okay to do that with multiple people at the same time at that point, but then when it shifts to actual formal dating, then you make that shift to just be with the one person? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, and the boundaries of intimacy should be clear. <laughs> for the man and the woman, and there can be some variation. I know people hate the double standard, but there is, it's just, we're different. Um, men have a little bit more leeway. I'm not saying that it's okay for men to be multiple dating, but I'm saying there's a little bit more leeway with them. With women, loyalty and, and your own like honor is so important. Like virtue, I guess is a better word for women, but that is so important for us if we're, seeking sexual and uh, just a validation from multiple sources and physical affection from multiple sources that doesn't do us any good. It's mm -hmm. different for men. Men don't have the same connection between emotions and hormones and physical satisfaction, right? Um, they, I don't, I don't, with my clients in particular, I don't encourage them or to be more specific, I discourage them strongly from having any kind of physical sexual relations with more than one person. But, you know, do you kiss someone like when you're getting to know them and then you're getting to know somebody else? So you might be vetting a couple of people in very early stages mm -hmm. and it may cross the line of affection where there's some kind of physical touch. Mm -hmm. But my boundary that I encourage for men is no sex with multiple people. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas for women, it's a little bit sooner that boundary. It's like if you feel your interest with one particular man, then go that route and, mm -hmm. you know, sort of shut down everything else while you put all your attention into it, which is very different than what a lot of dating coaches tell women. Extremely different. <laughs> yeah, I know. But the problem is. <laughs> Women cannot handle multiple mm -hmm. sources of connection. We just mm -hmm. can't. It creates way too much anxiety for us, insecurity. And, you know, we're meant to pair bond with one particular person, in my opinion. And so if you are compartmentalizing by being, oh, well, this guy's super attractive. This guy has all the resources I need. He'd make a great provider. This guy's just so much fun. Mm -hmm. If you're doing that <laughs> and you're having like three parallel relationships, you're basically trying to hedge your bets and have your cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. And it's never going to work. You're never mm -hmm. going to choose one person because no one's going to have everything to the nth degree like that, right? You right. have to find the whole package where they have enough of everything that you need. And so you're wasting a, a lot of time. Women don't have as much time as men do, right? Like mm -hmm. we need to have an efficient process of pair bonding because our fertility window, if you want to have children, you know, it, it limits us. Definitely. So, 
So just to clarify, the distinction between getting to know someone versus dating someone is that dating kind of implies some type of physical connection, some type of physical intimacy is happening there, whereas getting to know someone, physical intimacy is not necessarily happening. It's just like a, yeah, going out on walks, things like that, not necessarily like cuddling at the end of the night or something. Right. Or, right exactly. Okay. It's more like your friends still, mm -hmm. you know, like you, when you're a single person, especially as a woman, we're friendly creatures. We love right. to connect with people. It doesn't have to be sexualized, mm -hmm. but for men, it's different men. If they're going to spend time with a woman, it's a sexualized thing for the mm -hmm. most part, right? Like unless you're established friends without like any kind of sexual ties or whatever. But if a man is interested in you and he wants to spend one-on-one -on -one time with you, that's a sexualized thing. Mm -hmm. And I think women need to just understand that mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. spending time with a man one-to-one -one is for that purpose. They want to see if it goes down that road, uh, obviously he's going to have his own values and boundaries, but you know, that's just how it works. And so for women, we just are friendly with people. Like if we're talking on social media with random people, it's not because we're trying to necessarily get some kind of sexual gratification from them. Sometimes <laughs> it's just that we're friendly and, and uh, we're being polite or that's how we were socialized. So I know I've, I've probably gone on a tangent by now, but no, one of no. One thing I think I will I will explain that doesn't get said that much. It's kind of old school, but okay, I'll just do it. Um, the impression that we give people when we go out on dates is that we are probably physically intimate with someone. Mm -hmm. And so you can't always rely on explaining to someone but I'm not sexual with them. We're not having sex. We're just going out on dates. You have to assume if you're going out on dates with someone, it may, gives the impression that you're probably sexually intimate with them. Mm -hmm. And that makes perfect sense. A healthy, high value man is not going to want a woman who is dating multiple people. Mm -hmm. So would you, would you agree that when a woman, if a woman is dating multiple people, let's say, um, if she does come across a man who kind of has it all, do you think that she'll just internally develop that tunnel vision for the one man? Or do you think that she's less likely to, um, find that when she's dating so many people like that? Um, I do, I do think women get tunnel vision quite mm -hmm. easily, usually based on high levels of desire. Mm -hmm. So my challenge when working with women is always to say, yeah, but are you compatible with them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I guess it goes both ways. Men have the same difficulty too, but um, I don't, it's, it's tricky. Like if a woman doesn't really connect that strongly with a man, um, this is where the, the love, the woman has to love the man more mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of comes into play. Like if she doesn't get that tunnel vision, she doesn't properly pair bond with him. She always kind of has like her foot out the door or her eye on the, the grass being greener on the other side. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. She's got to, she's got to lock in. Um, men are different. Like when men like choose a woman, they're, they're all in. It, it doesn't really change that much do you know mm -hmm. what i mean like they're um they're they don't have like they're high i don't want to say they are hypergamous in any way but they have some element of that that mm -hmm. is similar like they may go for the younger more fertile woman mm -hmm. right and that's that's their sort of drive is to have um younger fertile more fertile women but oftentimes men don't leave their loving wives to go seek uh, a younger fertile woman these days, right? It was mm -hmm. more like at the same time, they would have multiple wives, right? But mm -hmm. that's not necessarily the norm now. So for a woman though, a woman will leave a man and go to another man who she feels meets her needs better, much more readily. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a high percentage of women pursuing divorce, uh, and remarriage, right? And that is why, like you said, the woman should be the one to love the man more. 
in, in, in that certain way. And I, I mean, I, I know it's like an oversimplistic way of. Yes. Yeah. But that's what we, that's what I mean when I say it, it's like the fawning yeah. the woman should be fawning over the man more mm -hmm. than he should be fawning over her. The, the way a man loves is more internalized mm -hmm. and the way that the woman loves is much more demonstrative, demonstrative, sorry. Um, but that doesn't mean the man doesn't show his love by giving gifts or doing romantic things. Absolutely. But in general, men, when they're healthy, should have more of an emotionally reserved way about them. If they're mm -hmm. carrying on like women, they've been effeminate. I never say the word right, but you know what I mean. They yeah, become yeah. more effeminate, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a line for the different sexes according to what our biology dictates and what that natural balance is between masculinity and femininity in each of us. Mm -hmm. So we just don't want to encourage men to turn up their femininity <laughs> over the top right. and for women to turn up their masculinity to be over the top. Like we want it to be calibrated in a healthy balance for both people and encourage, yeah. you know, those complementary demonstrations of affection and love in those ways. Coming back to that. <laughs> yeah. This was so good. This was so good. And do you think, um, so, okay. So back to the whole, topic of the video what is healthy love supposed to feel yes. like so when someone is in a um, healthy relationship overall day to day what do you say that actually feels like on a day-to-day -day level past the infatuation stage past the you know the whole like tunnel vision stage like when a, when a couple is in a relationship for maybe a couple years now and they're kind of settled together what does that actually feel like? Does it feel like anything? Is it, does it change day to day or is it pretty stable or what are the emotions that you think should be present in a long lasting, healthy relationship? Well, the security is going to be there, right? You're going to choose to be there. It's going to feel safe. It's going to feel comfortable Mm -hmm. um, in the good way of comfort, not in the bad way of comfortable, but mm -hmm. there's always going to be a little bit of tension in a healthy relationship. And that's oh, interesting. That sexual polarity. I use the 80, 20 principle. So 80% mm -hmm. comfort, 20% healthy tension, teasing friction. That's mm -hmm. the contrast between us as men and women. So mm -hmm. we, we don't want to be so overly saturated in the lovey dovey comfort that we don't keep that room for contrast, which is, I call friction, mm -hmm. I don't mean like <laughs> argumentation yeah. and combat, but just that healthy distinction where it'll keep the spark alive. Um, it's very similar to, well, I don't want to go on a tangent. Let's, I know we're, <laughs> we're, we're running out of time. So yeah, that, yeah. that's part of it is, is understanding that healthy, safe and secure relationship isn't boring. It's not a hundred percent flat line. Mm -hmm. So I hope that that, that will be a, a good takeaway for people to leave with is just the comfort, maybe 80% the foundation, mm -hmm. but then you're still going to have fluctuations throughout that, you know, a mm -hmm. life together is going to be full of challenges and stressors and change. People mm -hmm. change constantly. So love is that commitment to being a team to being attached. Mm -hmm. Like it's this default mindset of you being connected to someone. Mm -hmm. Now that's different than feeling like you need someone. Mm -hmm. like you're, you're completed by someone. You can't survive. You can't breathe without them. That's not love. Mm -hmm. That's dependence, right? Like that's right. going to be an unhealthy form of attachment. But if you feel that the relationship you've, you've vetted well and you've chosen someone that brings the best out in you, mm. that supports you even on your worst days, you know, that whenever you face a challenge, you grow. So it's going to feel like constant evolution, even though it's consistent over time, if that makes sense. It's like, you know, and this is where my sports references always come up. I was a national beach volleyball player. So oh, cool. You know, in beach volleyball, it's two people in a team, like two on two, mm -hmm. it's not like six people, like in regular volleyball. And what they used to always tell us in the beginning of training, like way back in the beginning of the years, 
is imagine there was a rope tying you and your partner together, mm -hmm. like at your waist. And so wherever you moved on the court, we had to move in tandem together. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't fight, like you can't both go two different ways and pull each other apart. Like if your partner decides to go up to the net, you have to move a little bit to cover the space that they have in accordance to where they're going to and vice versa. So it's very similar in a healthy relationship. You mm -hmm. have to default to this idea that you're a team and that you're moving together, even if you're not like robots moving, like mirroring each other. There is a dance that mm -hmm. you, you move and you sway, but in a, a very complementary way. It's like creating a harmony together. You know when you're in flow, mm -hmm. with your, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't mean like healthy doesn't mean this. Healthy is like you're in mm. flow, you're in harmony together, constantly evolving. But there's that that security of the attachment that bonds you mm -hmm. in a way um, that only elevates you as, as like the two of you together become a better whole. But you're two whole individuals. Mm -hmm. I love that. So that is that that was really great. So healthy love, there should definitely be desire. There should definitely be a spark. There should it shouldn't feel like you're settling. It shouldn't feel like you're bored every day. But it will have that. I love that analogy. Like it's not flat, but it's like a, <laughs> a little wave dance. So yeah. this was so, so great. Um, you guys, I hope you enjoyed the video today. This was such a pleasure to have Dr. Taylor Burroughs on. I mean, I definitely learned a lot. I hope you guys did too. And um, I also left um, links to all of um, Dr. Taylor's social media in the description box below. So definitely go make sure to subscribe to her YouTube, check out her Instagram, follow her there. I don't know if I put your Twitter down there, but if I didn't, I'll add that. Sure. <laughs> Are you on anything else or any other things you want to? I've gotten onto with? TikTok now. I'm trying to get to a thousand followers because I'm trying to do lives with some of my colleagues. So if people want to find me on TikTok, uh, at Dr. Taylor Burroughs on TikTok. Okay, cool. Perfect. Yeah. But I think Instagram and, and YouTube are my bigger focuses now because I'm really getting that the video content out is my main, main priority now. So I appreciate that. And thank you for having me on too. This is. Oh great. yeah, of course. Yeah. This was, this was a really, really great conversation. I really enjoyed it. So you guys, thank you all so much for tuning in. Hope you learned something and we will catch you later. I'm going to end the broadcast.